I think that in science, uh, in particular, people have to be open minded in some sense, because they're often coming from abroad, they're often alone, they rely on being allies to each other. <laughs> Welcome back to Offspring Magazine, the podcast, the podcast where we discuss topics around careers, open access, equal opportunity, and all kinds of things we experience during our PhDs. I'm your host, Allison Lewis, joined by my co-host, Sandra Fendel. Today on the podcast, we are talking to Nadine Gogola, a group leader at the Max Planck Institute of Neurobiology. We're talking to Nadine about how our identity can impact the way we consider our scientific career choices and the importance of balancing these personal needs with our professional lives. We talk about the value of seeing ourselves in the spaces we inhabit and how we can be allies to make these spaces more inclusive. just give a small introduction to yourself and what you're doing, Nadine? So my name is Nadine Gogola and I am a research group leader um, at the Max Planck Institute of Neurobiology uh, outside Munich. It's very exciting. So what do you do at the Institute for Neuroscience? Like what kind of research do you do? Yeah, my lab studies uh, emotions, the neuronal underpinnings of emotions. And we use uh, mice as animal model. And we're trying to solve circuits that could underlie different features of emotions, such as uh, valence, um, how do the body talk to the brain? Um, yeah, how do we perceive emotions? Uh, how do emotions elicit physical, but also behavioral changes? How do they affect the thing? making and so on. Were there ever times where you didn't want to stick with science? Because it can, it can be really hard. It can be it's a lot of failure. And I think a lot of people not in science don't see that. Were there ever times you wanted to give up? Um, yeah, every two years, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's good um, to hear. <laughs> yeah, I think that I, I never thought that I was a born scientist. There were many occasions where I thought I could be doing so many things. Um, I was interested in psychology. Uh, I was interested in arts and I thought maybe teaching would be better. Um, so I always put everything into question or very regularly. And I thought that <clears throat> the scientific career was very good for this because it, it gives you ways to go on for some time, for some years, but still have opportunities to, to branch out and do something else. So I know that some of my friends really went into teaching because especially in Germany, there was some lack of teachers and they tried to recruit from students who studied biology or medicine or so on. Um, also, I, I was interested in the pharmaceutical industry at one point. But in the end, I, I always stuck with science because I decided that it was better. So for me, at least. How important was it for you to have women as role models when considering whether to stay in science? Um, I think it was very important, but um, I also had male mentors who just told me you can have it. You just do not need to wait until somebody else does it. In the end, it has to be you who, who achieves this. And um, especially my PhD mentor was very much supportive of this idea. And he, he did even tell me that maybe in my case, it would be easier to move to the US and start a family. Um, so he really supported me and just by telling me that he thought it was possible. I think it, he, it wasn't a role model, but he was pushing me into the right um, direction. When you say um, in your case, it might have been better to go to the US. What, what do you mean? Like what was special about the US that may have been more suited to you than anywhere in Europe? Yeah, so I'm in a same-sex relationship, right? I'm married to a woman. And mm -hmm. at the time um, I did my PhD, I met her. And uh, at that time, until today, I have to say, it's much harder in, in Germany, at least. And we were in Switzerland together 
Um, she is French. So in all those countries that we were aware of, having children was still difficult, was some sort of a gray zone, which wasn't really possible, but some people managed, not illegally, but somehow in some gray zone where they managed to organize this. While in the US, there were official paths uh, to achieve pregnancy, to get married, um, and so on, at least in the state where we went, which was Massachusetts. So it's not true for all the states of mm -hmm. the US, or was it true at this point, but for the coasts, it, it was true. And they were more advanced than Europe in this uh, metric. So, so you did go to the States for a while then? Yes, for six years. Okay. And if, if you thought the States was maybe better suited, what made you then decide to come back to Germany if, if, at the, if you, know, you originally didn't think it was the right choice? Yeah, I think um, two things. One is that we had achieved to get a child and get married. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, so this was ticked off and we could afford to come back. Um, before we moved back, we made sure we could have a second child here in Germany. And then by that time, it was totally possible. And by that time, also, we were able to marry uh, both in Germany and in France. So things had evolved. Um, the other thing was that we realized that having a family in the U.S., um, is different than having it in Europe because the social security system mm -hmm. isn't that um, developed there or isn't that supportive of families. So that was a reason. Plus having our own family, so grandparents and uncles and aunts around was also a nice thing that we wanted to have back. But we were hesitant. I mean, we considered staying in the US, um, but eventually I think it was a very good choice for us to come back to Europe. Okay. Yeah, I, I wondered about this kind of what you brought up, like, you know, it's maybe legally or logistically possible, you know, in America or even now in Europe. But I think that's kind of only half the equation of, you know, having a family life and doing science. Like there's also the social support that you mentioned, the family. And I wonder, do, do you feel like you have that side of the equation in Europe? Um, We're in the States as well, I guess. Yeah, so um, in Germany, it was much easier for us. So for our families are both six hours drive away, so they weren't here every day. But the childcare system in Germany being uh, much less expensive, it was affordable mm -hmm. for us. In the US, it's almost a postdoc salary that goes into childcare for very young children, so that that would have been uh, impossible during my postdoc. And then if I had taken up a, an advanced job there, it would have been at least a huge budget. Um, and here it was much easier in this respect. And, and the work provided a childcare place for me. So this was very easy then. So um, everything that you told us now, it sounds like that you're obviously very open with your relationship and your sexual orientation. Has this always been the case or, and maybe more specifically, is there something specific about the scientific community that made you feel in the past that you could be open or maybe not that open that you have to hide something? What was your experience with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I have come out when I was 26, I think. So not, it wasn't always so easy for me or clear for me. I think that for me, this were more personal reasons. And the more I think I was still in Germany and in an environment where people thought they knew me and assumed that I would um, have a certain sexual orientation, that was much harder. I think in this respect, science has really made it so easy for me because I moved around, I moved abroad. And when you get into a totally new place and people don't know you, they ask you a lot of questions and you just tell from the start how who you are and, and what you are. And I think that in science uh, in particular, people have to be open minded in some sense because they're often coming from abroad. They're often alone. They rely on being allies to each other. And so for this, science was really uh, liberating for me and has it made it much easier. It sounds like being open was almost like self-reinforcing. Like you said, the more you said it, the better I felt, the more open I was, the e like 
it would you make it sound easy <laughs> it, it is yeah. it, did it feel just easy yeah i think that um coming out um uh, was for me difficult and long okay like, so with 26 i mean there is like whatever eight or ten years or whatsoever that you were already starting to have relationships that you're trying things out and that you always feel something is wrong and that you do not feel entirely who you are yourself or at least that that was my experience and when i eventually came out everything the burden kind of fell off and that definitely had to do with the fact that i i had to explain to my family which was it was very easy. Um, mm -hmm. They were also kind of happy and relieved that it was out of the sack. <laughs> and then um, at work, it really helped. I mean, I really think that if you are caught in a certain environment for years, if you have never moved out from home or something, maybe this could be much harder. Or if your family isn't accepting, I don't think um, that one can just know. I think for every person, it's different. I don't think one can assume. I think what I definitely do not like is some people may, there's a wide range of opinions of, um, of this, um, say, diversity problem, right? Some people mm -hmm. may say, why do we actually still discuss it? It's not an issue, right? Our societies are very welcoming. It's not an issue anymore. And then I would say, well, you do not know. For some people, it may be hard. For my, some people, it may be hard if you go to the bank and they assume you have to have a husband or you cannot open your bank account alone. I mean, I've sat in the bank and uh, with my brother and they assumed he has to decide who spends the money. And then we're like, no, it's my brother. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I mean, it's not always easy. Or if you live in a village and the people are not nice to you, um, yeah, so I don't think it's a no-brainer. I, I also think that there are certain European countries which are like five hours drive from here who are putting out politics which are very threatening and very scary, right? And and yeah, I think the more you're open and, and put things straight and that you do not want to deal with people who, who are not accepting, you know, then you have to filter them out very soon. Otherwise, they can get at you, right? And and so I think that this mentality, there's no problem, we don't need to discuss it anymore, is definitely not true. Also not for very young people who have to maybe to come out to their parents, to their siblings, to their classmates. I think there's still huge problems. I mean, my, my boy is 10 years old now, and they're already starting jokes about gay people. Um, so it's not done, right? But it's also... I mean, I think there's also very positive messages, right? So that, for instance, I have not personally suffered from discrimination at the job or something that I think I can be very proud and happy in my relationship. All my neighbors, all my colleagues are very accepting. And for them, it's really a, a no-brainer. And that is very nice, right? So I think there are different sides and in the end, uh, I guess I meet very many international students and for some of them it's very easy and for others it's maybe much harder. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you describe a lot to consider and that a lot that's still going on. And so you said you said you came out during your PhD and that you did spend a long time before that, like kind of exploring yourself. And I guess I'm wondering, was there a particular thing that pushed you to come out or you know what prompted you to finally get over that hmm. I, I think it was a conversation with uh with a friend from my phd um and it was very in some sense it's very stupid it sounds very stupid right but i literally told him and he was a very close friend so i told him i think you know i'm attracted to women and since maybe a long time and i'm really in love and but I think that people like me, there aren't any other gay people who are like me. Because what I could see openly, I mean, I went, I studied in Paris before this, and I went to many gay prides. And because in Paris, it was just a thing where everybody went, it's fun, right? And people who are very openly gay, sometimes at the gay pride who are on the car, right? They, 
they kind of look very different. I'm much more, you know, I, I do not try to attract too much attention to me with my hairstyle or my clothes or in general. So I thought maybe people like me are not there, right? And I do not enjoy going to to the nightclub. I rather go hiking, right? And so mm-hmm. it felt, and then I also felt people will look differently at me. And, and my friend just told me, if, if you feel like this and there are 7 billion people in the world, it's very unlikely that there's nobody like you. <laughs> so um, he just said, you know, whatever it is that you really enjoy or what you think defines you, maybe you should try to meet gay people there. And so in the end, I enrolled in an um, athletic club for gay people because I, I really enjoyed sports. And then mm-hmm. I realized, well, actually, maybe this is a good starting point for me rather than going to a nightclub and feeling all alone. Is, is this also the reason maybe why now as a, as a group leader, you're so open with your sexual orientation? So for instance, I saw that, I mean, you're now talking to us, which is amazing. Then um, on Twitter, I saw that you have the little small um, pride flag there. Also. Is that the name? Yeah, yes, right. Right. yeah. <laughs> you have this little flag there so is maybe your experiences um did this kind of um then lead you to being open with it now because i think it is extremely important also to have role models uh, also for s- different sexual orientations and then as you said like a lot of different role models because there's not just one lesbian person or one queer person and one type that you have to fit in right yeah yeah i think that's very true i think trying to as i said i didn't meet anybody i was dating in that athletic club but just seeing some people who i found oh they enjoy the same things they maybe have a similar lifestyle to mine or they look like me or they come from the same town you know some of these things where you think okay i can identify now um this really helps so you know if i talk about it openly it's for two things one is that maybe it can help younger people just to see that it's possible the the other thing is that i have two children and i cannot hide this right they have two moms and they have to know and they have to be proud of this so if i do not manage to be open i I, I mean, they have to come out for somebody else every day. If they go to a new um, sports club, if they go to a new activity and one mom uh, drops them off and another mom picks them up, the children are asking. And so my children have to come out in some sense for their own moms every day. And I, I think if I would be hiding something that this could be, very damaging to them because there is nothing to hide. I want them to know this is totally normal. This is, and and they do not perceive a big difference right now because wherever I go, I present my wife as my wife. Um, So these are the two reasons which I think are really also encouraging me to never make it a secret. What can allies do to try and create a better environment where people don't feel that way where people can have a better experience and maybe feel confident to come out and to be their true selves. Yeah. Again, I have only very like general rules, which I think apply Mm -hmm. to many problems. I think one is to, to not ignore such incidences if you see them happen, right? If, if you feel that people in the lab are not talking to each other in a friendly way or that somebody is not participating in the social events or is constantly somehow bullied by, even if it's only one lab member, maybe just speak up because on the next day it could be you, it could be for something else, right? It could be... So I think, and then the other thing is maybe not assume too much because if somebody is not out, for instance, or is not so comfortable yet, or for any reason can't right now communicate um, their situation. Mm -hmm. Um, I think assuming and pushing people into a corner just creates a lot of tension, right? As soon as everybody thinks you must be straight, you must have a boyfriend somewhere, you must be this or that, then it's very hard because you have to essentially correct people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
That makes sense, yeah. And I also think still that very often at uh, institutes, for instance, now in the science world, the trainings can be really important because just not everybody's so aware of the things that we're talking about now. And even just making a stupid joke, for instance, is not funny and is not a joke then for somebody else, right? So I, I think or I hope that in the future that there will be also more trainings for people who are not so sensitive with these topics um, just to, and also on the other side, what you mentioned now for how to be a good ally, also to learn then how to speak up and how to call out people maybe and how to react in such situations. I, I think that's important and you can always learn more about that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I also think that what I mentioned earlier is that that's also uh, a woman issue, but also an LGBTQ issue is when people start thinking that it's a no issue anymore. Because, you know, if you hear me talking, as you said several times now, it all sounds so positive, right? And maybe it's true right now, it's a no issue for me. But assuming that it will be a no issue for a 24 year old a student coming from some other situation, right? Whether it's Germany, a different country, a different family, um, a different gender or a gender identity, whatever, it, it, it's never the same for everyone and the experiences are not the same. And so just saying this isn't a problem anymore is just not true. I mean, as much as women are underrepresented and have still a lot of um, fights to fight, I think LGBTQ community has still a lot of fights. and laws can always switch back and forth so we're i think i can really say that we're still vulnerable in some sense we because right now maybe in germany laws are rather permissive but i do not know what would happen if another party is elected and it can always turn around as it has in other countries right so it's important also to always um keep in mind that it's still a small minorities and minorities are threatened I think that's just as it is, whatever minority you're part of, you're always threatened by the majority. I guess I want to know if one of your PhD students came to you and they were gay or lesbian and they asked you kind of the same advice you asked your PhD supervisor, what kind of advice would you give them about their career and going on in science? Yeah, I mean, I do not see why a gay person or woman should not go on science. <laughs> Um, it, it, the scientific interest should be determinant, right? And I think you choose where the environment you go. So I think that's important. Just try to choose as much as you choose scientifically the best environment, just do not drop this part of your personality, of your identity, right? So you have to choose a good lab and a good country um for this i think if you ne neglect this part then it becomes a bit dangerous right maybe if you you just say oh i'm i'm so motivated to pursue science but i'm also gay but this cannot be a part of this de decision or it cannot be a part of the decision which led to join i think that could be in my opinion dangerous just take it into account right and if somebody would come to me and say what do you think? Where I should go? There's this great lab, but I have some worries how acceptant it is or how acceptant the country or the town is. And I have this other lab and I would probably say you have to find a good solution for all parts of you, the professional and the private uh, part. Mm -hmm. and I think that's also maybe why it worked well for me, because um, I for the US, for instance, I only considered the states on the coast where I know it was very liberal. Yeah. And it may be sad, but you know, you have to, you can try to improve the system and, and be advocating issues, but while a system is in place, you also have to work with the system, right? And so I would not go to certain countries. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I would not work in certain cities right now. I, I, do, I just do not want this for my family, for myself. Um, and that doesn't mean that I'm accepting the situation. So do you think then the Max Planck, like society in general, could take a stronger hand in saying like, 
okay, for Pride Month, we are going to do something central like we do for mental health awareness or having trainings from the Plank Academy as part of onboarding. Do you think these are solutions that could help improve the system? Yes, yes, I think so. I think that should be part of the training. And I, I think the more broad it is, the more it is helpful. Because, you know, we're, we're I think what also bothered me a bit before coming out was that I didn't want to be fine just as a lesbian, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have anything. And I'm not only a scientist also. I go out there, I'm a mom, um, I'm a woman, whatever, you know, maybe you, you think you're an athlete or you are a Buddhist, uh, you know, you, there are so many parts of um, your personality, which all also could create problems or misunderstandings at workplace. So I think that, um, yeah, maybe creating training to be inclusive, to be accepting, to be open-minded, how to create diversity and maybe also, you know, create awareness that it's not yet a no-brainer, that diversity is an issue in Germany at Max Planck, but also as it is in many other countries, right? In science in particular, it's a very white dominated, Western money dominated uh, profession, right? The, in many countries to have access to training that allows you to pursue a scientific career is just very elitist. You have to have money in many countries to, to do this, right? So you will, if you are here, you may not encounter all people in China or all people of India. You may already encounter just a certain fraction of those. Um, and even I would almost argue in Germany that the, the education system is still also quite elitist and is a little bit based on the education of the parents, right? Mm -hmm. so. I think it's the same way in Canada. I mean, yeah, you're very lucky when you can go to university in Canada. It's not free like in Germany. And so there's already this barrier. So I think it's probably true everywhere. Yeah. And this resides in the end in a, in a not so diverse profession, right? So um, we have to be inclusive. We have to try to make it more diverse and the more it's diverse, the more people can find their role models. After talking to Nadine, one lesson I took for myself and I think could be helpful to any young scientist is the importance of considering your own identity and your values in addition to the science when moving forward with your career. I find science incredibly rewarding but it isn't without challenges. Working close to the limits of your knowledge can feel like a lot of pressure, and it often makes me question my own competence and ability. It often feels like many, many failures before success. And as Nadine said, everyone comes with their own history and experiences into science. And so I think considering and respecting what I need in my personal life, like Nadine said, could make those inevitable challenges that I'll face in a scientific career easier to take in stride. Another thing Nadine brought up about striving for inclusivity in the workplace is the self-selecting nature of elective trainings and workshops and how the people taking them are maybe not the people who need them most. And it made me wonder how we could try and promote these ideas in our day-to-day -day work so that we can reach the people who may not consider going to a training. I've thought about small signifiers like perhaps a pride sticker on my laptop or even sewing a flag patch onto my lab coat. Or maybe some small way I hope I can identify myself as an ally and also express my values to my colleagues. And maybe talking more about the reasons I use inclusive language rather than just doing it, since some people may not yet know why I do it or even notice that I'm speaking differently at all. So in addition to considering what I need to be myself, I hope I can also create an environment where others feel empowered to do the same. That's our show. Thanks for joining us and to our guest, Nadine Gogola. See you next time. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net and the Science Communication Working Group, known as the Offspring Magazine. 
This episode was produced by Allison Lewis and Sandra Fendel. It was edited by Allison Lewis and Adrian Lahola Chomia. The intro outro music is composed by Srinath Ramkumar, and the pre intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizo. The podcast series is hosted by Adrian Lahola Chomiak, Allison Lewis, Beatrice Landsbergen, Nikolai Herman, Sandra Fendel, and Srinath Ramkumar, with social media support from Nadia Piragova. For any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcast at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe and stay healthy. Bye-bye.